Good evening, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sylvia Yeo, and I will be your MC for tonight. Now, welcome to the LSE lecture on Harnessing Big Data, Challenges and Opportunities. When we sent out the invitation, we were actually quite overwhelmed. Uh, over 335 and counting, the, not counting the walk-ins, are actually registered for this talk. So thank you for coming for tonight's lecture. Uh, in the audience, we have quite a few from um, government and stat boards. We also have people from the different schools. And we have a selection of students as well. And uh, I think you can't run away because we can recognize your school uniforms. <laughs> so welcome to everyone. Quite a few are, of you are also in healthcare, the hospitals. Welcome. A warm welcome to to a dear friend of SIM, Her Excellency, Mrs. Dorte Berg Vassad, Ambassador of Denmark to Singapore. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> now, for tonight, we'll be taking questions online, and uh, we would like you to actually log on to slido.com. Details are on the screen. So if you can take out your uh, mobile phones and just go to slido.com and the event code is LSE18. All right, LSE18. If you need password or rather uh, Wi-Fi access, uh, look to the right for the SIM Wi-Fi. We'll remind you of the information again later on. Feel free to punch in your questions. Um, so it's slido.com and the event code is LSE18. 18. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the fourth public lecture by the London School of Economics. In the past, we had people such as Professor Connor Geerty, who spoke on liberty and security. And when we launched the international relations degree, we had the pleasure of Professor Michael Cox, who spoke on Asia in a Chinese century. Today's lecture is held in conjunction with the launch of the BSc Data Science and Business Analytics. In fact, we, along with the undergraduate, we also have two graduate diplomas. Of course, the academic direction is by the Department of Statistics at the London School of Economics, and, of, and the degree is awarded by University of London. Since we started with one class of 40 students, and it was a management degree, uh, 40, uh, 32 years ago, we currently enroll about 2,500 students per year for the last three years in a suite of undergraduate and postgraduate uh, qualifications ranging from accounting, accountancy to economics, digital innovation to politics. And these programs are led by University of London colleges, namely LSE, Goldsmiths and University College London. In fact, in 2017, just last year, we saw a record 225 graduate with a BSc with first class honours. And this was a record. It was close to 11% of our graduating cohort. So at this time, I would like to show you a video that in a way showcases the partnership between SIM and the University of London and how it has positively impacted our students' academic careers. You are enrolling into a world-class program. You get to learn something new every day about a different culture. It trains the students to think from very different perspectives. really attracted towards the University of London program because of its connection towards London and how the curriculum is really challenging and being set by some of the best professors in the world. My personal journey here in SIM has been a fantastic one so far. I feel that SIM is a great place to be studying the University of London program because of its close connection to London School of Economics and lectures actually come down for revision classes. 
I always find my teaching visits to Singapore very uh, rewarding and enjoyable. It's great to be able to actually interact with our students. Students taking these programs should develop a strong set of analytical skills to be able to critically assess and critique evidence which is presented to them. The beauty of studying in SIM is that it offers you a whole host of extracurricular activities. You have sports, music, drama. I've been blessed to be given an opportunity to go to many places like Mexico, USA, Hong Kong as part of the University Scholars Leadership Summit. SIM has really given me an amazing opportunity to uh, network with friends. I found a lot of friends from uh, different countries and uh, different culture. I was awarded scholarships for the LSC summer program. I felt that it was a really rewarding experience because the lecturers were really bringing in cutting-edge research to help us understand the concepts and topics in a deeper manner. I think the University of London degree has really provided me a very strong foundation in terms of pursuing my further studies. So in University of London, I study the models and concepts and the theories. And in London School of Economics, I study it in a more applied manner. The University of London program really prepares me with the relevant skills to be successful in the career I choose. One day, a headhunter actually contacted me about this opportunity and I was offered uh, this graduate trainee role at Schroeder's Investment Management. If someone was thinking about joining the University of London um, with SIM, I would definitely say yes. We hope that video shed some light as to the partnership we have between the London School of Economics and SIM, as well as University of London. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our speaker for this evening is Professor Yao Chi Wei, Professor of Statistics at the LSE. Professor Yao is a specialist in time series, especially in non-linear time series, and more recently, high-dimensional and complex time series. He has been a consultant to companies such as Barclays Bank, EDF Energy, and Winton Capital. And I understand there are some um, Singapore staff from uh, EDF who are in our midst this evening. Welcome. And in addition, Professor Yao is a fellow of the American Statistical Association, He's a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. He's a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. And Professor Yao is an elected member of the International Statistical Institute. So presenting challenges and opportunities for data analytics, please welcome Professor Yao Chi Wei. <laughs> Professor Yao, please. Good evening. I'm overwhelmed by the warm reception and by your attendance in this evening. I understand many of you just finished your day work in the office, and I hope I can keep you awake. The title of the talk, Harness Big Data, Challenges and Opportunities, I think for the amount of talks given by statisticians, this is one of the most uh, attractive ones. This morning, when I sit in the airplane, I was thinking I can change the title to Harness Statistics, Challenges and Opportunities. I don't need to change that much of my talk, but I guess I will lose a large proportion of the audience. <laughs> Some of you may think of leaving right now. And, uh, what I'm trying to say is this big data, data science, and data analytics become a buzzword, which catches people's imagination and uh, curiosities from all sectors in our society. So what I'm trying to do in the next 45 minutes, let me switch on my timer, yeah. is to share with you some of my own understanding and some stories I learned 
in last couple of years about the data analytics applied in variety of practical problems. We also will show you some features of big data, how it changes the data analysis. Data analysis in research and in applications. And uh, we also mentioned some opportunities and challenges. So I'm not going to do it in kind of unilateral order, but hopefully after this talk, I can convey some of my understanding and uh, knowledge on those three areas. Okay, what is data analytics? What is data science? So I put one version of definition here. Data analytics is a science of examining data in order to draw conclusions. It enables companies and organizations to make data-driven decisions, DDD. It can be used to verify, disprove existing hypothesis and theory. And data science extracts information from data such that undiscovered patterns of hidden relationship and so on. So when you read the definitions, actually the difference is not so huge. Of course, the analytics emphasizes on the applications and data science is more talking about extracting information from data. Actually, this is what we statistics have been doing for a long, long time. Uh, why this becomes so important? We, as a teacher, we teach students to prepare students for their career. We typically say, to have a successful career, you need to develop three, two, RQ and EQ. We used to think in the university, we should uh, teach students and uh, provide an em environment for students to develop their IQ. In the last 10 or 20 years, the emphasis on the EQ is important because personal skills, how to present yourself, how to communicate with other people is also important for the success business careers. Now we add one more Q, which is DQ. In the sense, how much you can figure out from the data. Being an AIC, most of our graduates ended working in industry. I have a few PhD students. After graduation, they came back to me and said, oh, day one, I started working in the company. I was given a computer, a few terminals, and a few data sets. I was told, do something. The natural question is, do what? So, we think with uh, this modern technology development in this information age, the DQ will play an ever increasingly important role. It's all about data. A uh, list of uh, different sets of the data we encountered uh, in different uh, sectors of society, the business data. Actually, this is not new. I remember when I arrived in Europe 25 or 30 years ago, there is a big company called Blockbust, which is doing this uh, videotapes, DVD renting. And uh, at that time, it was so, now it's out of business because nobody watching videos on the videotape or DVDs, it's all online. But at that time, they were so popular, they claim Within every U.S. city or town, there is a one blockbuster shop within 15 minutes driving distances. The company claims there are no more people in Mexico than the Mexican government because they have a huge membership uh, databases. There is one story which has been repeated several times in the business school uh, classes, which is at one stage, General Motors General Motors in America try to promote a new car. What do they do? They send out this beautifully printed fly to each household. They go to your local garage, test to drive your car. To give an incentive for people doing that, they say, after test, testing driver, you are given a voucher of 20 US dollars from blockbusters. 
you can rent the video or DVDs. Of course, not every people receive the fry will do that. But who will do that? GM doesn't know. Blockbuster knows. Because people did the testing driver will take the vouchers. So, therefore, the Blockbuster knows which type of custom is more likely to be interested in those, this particular type of cars. They have a department called Information Assets. What do they do? They look at the databases and dig out the information about each individual's the attributes. Some are interested in those cars, some are not. They run a very simple regression model. Give a score to each individual. Then they go back to the GM and say, look, I know which people, what kind of household you should send your fly, because those people are most likely to be interested in your new model of the car. But the information is not free, one dollar per name at that time, which was 20 and 25 or 30 years ago. The data privacy was not so much a big issue. Now, they still can sell the information to the GM. They sell one million names to GM and profit one million out of that. That was widely reported in the newspaper. And that's an old story. But nowadays, people try to use the business data to do various kinds of analysis, like shopping basket analysis. When you go to supermarkets, there are lots of goods displayed. They are not displayed in random order. And uh, which one should put it together? There are lots of analysis behind that. Because the supermarket try to maximize the sales. Uh, custom segmentation becomes important because when company advertising, they try to target the different custom group with different ads. And uh, this is the business data. Industry processing data, there are different kinds. As you probably know, the airplane engines, the jet engines for the big airplane, they are three major producers. Los Lois and GE and another French and uh, American companies. But for each engine they produced, they create uh, what they call the digit twins. So what do they do? For those jumbo engines, they install 100 sensors. The sensor will send back the information for the important parts of the engine back to the computer. So when the airplane fly outside, and uh, say the computer simulated the engine running in the producer's lab. In this way, they can monitor the performance. They can inform the airline, say, this engine needs a service or whatever. So this has become a very important uh, uh, tool to increase the safety. Financial market data, as we know, Nowadays, we have lots of historical data, and uh, you can look at the data, the particular stock, the trading transactions across the global when you make decisions. And high-frequency tradings, there are lots of data constantly generated in the milliseconds. And personal data, of course, recently there is a big story related to the Cambridge Analytical. And what people do is with personal data, they create the demographics and geographics information, which is important about factory uh, personal information and personality behavior information. And uh, psychographics, attitudinal, this is a word used very much by the Cambridge Analyticals. And those information are used for specific uh, personal advertising. And uh, as political campaign, their campaign send you information and stick on your most sort of fearful points. In this way, try to influence your voting behaviors. 
And of course, we also talk about the text and uh, unstructured data. In the old time, when we talk about data, we say data are numerical form. But nowadays, the images, the videos, and lots of news texts are part of the data. How to combine all this data for the uh, effective inference, extracted information is important. Uh, image data, as we know, this is face ID. I just read the news on the BBC yesterday. Singapore Airport is experimenting the face ID when you go through the passport control. You don't need to, in the future, you don't need to show the passport because they take your face image and uh, check it according to their databases. Of course, there are some concerns because you will not have the privacy as you used to be. Wherever you go, there is a face ID screening. The advantage is say, for airplane, some passengers missing, they can easily identify you. But uh, on the other hand, wherever you are, they can trace you. Probably this is not something we like to have. And there are all these kind of new developments related to the data collection and the data uses. I go through some stories here. This is a story reported on the New York Times in 2004. The Hurricane Francis, which threatened the Florida coast. Of course, the people school hospital and try to prepare for this incoming hurricanes. And the supermarket like Walmart should also try to prepare to store the goods which are most needed for the uh, hurricane period. Of course, they have common, they, they are common sense is say, okay, you should have water, flashlights. Those are things people typically will purchase before a hurricane. But they also look at their databases to check what people buy in the last hurricane. And uh, there are surprising findings. One particular, one particular kind of cakes, strawberry pop tarts, increased sales by seven times. And there is a particular DVD sold out before last hurricane. This could be a coincidence. DVD just released by that time. But the top hurricane, the pre-hurricane top selling item was beer. People find it difficult to understand that. But uh, this is one thing with the big data. Once data tell you, say, OK, beer and this type of cake are the top sales. You just store them, and uh, you don't ask why. So this is an interesting story. The second story is about predicting, predicting the custom churns. This is the issue encountered in all businesses. Custom leave, and you try to sign new customs. It creates a problem for all party concerned. And uh, like uh, utility supplies, I don't know about uh, Singapore, but in UK, there are only too many. They knock on your door and try to sell their scheme to you. But the tariffs are designed such that they are not directly comparable. A salesman try to convince you it's a good year for you to sign up. So, yeah, two years ago, there is a report by the the custom watchdog in UK. Traditionally, you would think, if I'm a loyal customer to a company, I should be rewarded for my loyalty. Unfortunately, it's no longer the case. The report says, if you don't switch your electricity gas supplies, you end up paying 10 to 15% more than averages. So what do they do? Now, typically, for a company, they have a fixed amount of budget. This budget should be distributed in the most eff effective way to catch new customs, to retain the current customs. If you stay loyal, they don't do anything with you. Yeah. So which is really a new phenomenon in this information ages. The home loan, equity loan, 
of Bank of America, they launched this new scheme, and they sent out several mail campaigns, but with only very minimal successes. Nobody signed up. So they asked the expert, marketing expert, why? Which type of custom we should try to advertise in? Because advertising is costly. When you think about this, say you send 1,000 ads to out, the return rate is one out of 1,000. Therefore, this return the custom need to cover the, all those advertising costs. So this is costly. They rather like to target those who are most likely to take these equity loans. The market experts say, oh, who would like to take remortgage their houses? Two types of people. People with the college age children college-aged children want loan to pay tuition fees. All people with a high income, but variable, they try to have a loan to stabilize the income fluctuations. But on the other hand, being a BOA, they have a large databases. And one thing I try to highlight is, for each person, each of their custom, they have about 250 attributes. Just think this way. Can you name 250 attributes of you to distinguish, distinguish you from other people? I tried. I can do about 20, 25. But they have 250 attributes there. Therefore, they have sent out some mails and some replied, some not. Therefore, for those part of customs, they can add one more attribute. Those who are interested in this loan, those are not. Therefore, they can mine the data and do a, what we call a clustering analysis. Clustering analysis is that you have a million customs there. You try to divide them into different clusters. Within each cluster, they share similar features. Okay. So this is what they did. And in the end, they have 14 cluster methods. This is done by the data mining or statistical learning or machine learning method. Yeah? With different names, they are the same things. When you look at those 14 clusters, they are, most of them are not so interesting. But one of them have two interesting attributes. In one cluster, those are a group of people put together, they share some fit similar features. Almost 40% of them have both business and personal accounts with the bank. Second, in this cluster, 25% of people are labeled as a likely respond for these particular loans. Therefore, in their campaign, they change the slogan. Before they listen to the market as Expert say, oh, using the value of your home to send your kids to the college. This is the old slogan. After doing this data mining, now they change it to now the house is empty, using your equity to do what you have always wanted to do. So the return rate, response rate, increased from 0.7% to 7%. So this is a, a successful story of data mining. I think I, I skip this. Gmail. Now I know the Facebook is under, under the spotlight, but let's not talk about Facebook. Let's talk about Google. Gmail. Gmail is a free email server, and lots of people use it. Some of my colleagues are not using Air not using LSE email, you prefer Gmail because they provide a bigger storage space, yeah, among other things. So when you think about Google, normally people think it's a very nice free search engine. In addition, there is a free e email server. And Google is so important 
in our lives. When I travel to China, because in China you cannot use Google, you immediately realize how important, how nice Google search is. But in fact, uh, the Google is the largest advertising company. After only 15 years, they make more money from ads than all world newspapers added together. But this is the new business model. The service is free in exchange for your personal information. Then they can advertise according to your personal information. Gmail, in 2014, there are 750 million of users. And up to one year later, is 900 million. There is a famous legal case started in 2010. Two lawyers in Texas discovered when you check Gmail, there are some ads flashing on the side. The contents of ads and contents of your email are correlated. We normally don't look at the ads when we read our emails. But that means Gmail is reading your emails. So this is a violation of privacy. Email should be very personal. OK, the case lasted for four years, at least. By 2014, there is only one out-of-court settlement for single individuals. Why is that? So Google won the cases in the end. There are two reasons. First, Google holds the adequate use consent. We always do that. When you check on, there is a legal term conditions printed in small prints and uh, run several pages. We just scroll to the bottom, then click and say yes. So you give the right to Google to read your email. And perhaps more surprisingly, Google actually lose money from Gmail service. The advertising via Gmail is not successful. Basically, most people check email, they don't read the ads. The people responsible to the ads together with Gmail is very, very minimal. So what's Google's uh, Advertising business can be simply described as a big spreadsheet. Yeah, big spreadsheet. On the top is different items they try to advertise. On the row, on the column, is million of individuals. So for each individual and uh, each item advertising, if this person is potentially interested in this one, there is one in the entrance. So these big spreadsheets are all entities, only have a sort of tiny, tiny percentages once indicates each individual is likely to be interest, interested in those items. Therefore, they are advertising accordingly. Where does the information come from? From our daily use of Google search. Oh, Google web browsers and from Gmail. In particular, they find the income emails tells a lot about individuals. So this is why Google losing money in Gmail but still keep providing the free services in exchange for your personal information. Okay. What is big data? What is big data? I did a search in 2012. I kept it. You search on Google. It's a data with data which are too extensive to permit iterative analysis. One pass analysis is necessary. Data sets which is stand, standard database, database tools cannot handle and data which exceeds 20% of your RAM. So in that time, big data 
is talking about the size of data. 2017, you can ask your iPhone, say what big data is. The answer like this, say information assets characterized by such a high volume, velocities, variety to require specific technology and analytic methods for its transformation into values. So this, you can see, now is not only about the sheer size of data, more talking about the applications. The values from the data. Wikipedia. I know, Singapore high institution discourages students to use Wikipedia. But let's read it. A term for data sets that are so large or complex that the traditional data processing application software is inadequate to deal with them. Big data challenges including capturing data, data storage, data analysis, search sharing, transform visualization, queuing, updating, and information privacy. Not bad. People talk about four V of five Vs of big data. Volume, we have seen what volume is. Variety and uh, data are inhomogeneous in terms of the format, in terms of the qualities. Velocity, talking about high speed of data accumulation and the processing. And the value, data themselves are not so attractive. The attractive is the value inside of the data. And uh, vanity, people think, okay, once we have big data, everything is clear. We don't need to worry about all those theory methods we used to take very seriously. We know what, we don't need to know why. Yeah. Which I try to say is not the case. So if you, if you type this word, spirit correlation in Google search, it will bring you a website which lists all those weird correlations. This is two time series. One is US spending on science, space, and technology. Another is the suicides by hanging and stagnation and suffocations. So those are two, as we understand it, uncorrelated time series. But correlation is almost one. It's not say driven by the increasing trend only. When you see this kind of fluctuation, bumpy coming down, up, bumpy coming down, up, they synchronize with each other almost perfectly. Why? Why this is the case? This is a, a problem of big data. There is a famous saying, say, if you touch, if you touch data enough, data will confess. In a sense, you can find whatever pattern you like to see like this. There are so many time series out there. You pick one, then search for second one, go through all those lots of time series, you will find the one which matches perfectly. There are not only one, there are more in that website. So this is a, what we call the spirit correlation. There's no reason those two things are correlated with each other because there are so many. You can search, you see some kind of coincidences within the range of data you observe. Those kind of pattern cannot be extended to the futures. Some big data stories, I'm not going to go through it one by one, but what I try to say is the digital data expand quickly. The data stored in computer almost doubles every three years. And it's not new. In the old time, we already have the data, which is huge. But why now, suddenly, big data become a big thing in life? I guess the automatic data capture in larger scale because of the IT advancement. We have the computer and the storage capacity. We can accumulate the data in the unprecedented size and speed. Exponential growth of computer memory speeds and the data analytics. Now, it's no longer a statistician talking about how to extract the information from data. Not only there, once you have information, those information are valuable, those value can be transferred into profits. 
Okay, there is a view that value shifting from the physical inf infrastructures we talk about in old time, you hold the assets, which is the land uh, factory, and so on and so forth. Then it transforms, at least partially, into the intangible, such as brands, intellectual properties. Now we should add the data. Why exciting? According to many, this new big data is a new world. McKenzie Company, it's a big consultancy company across the globe. It says we are on the cusp of the tremendous wave of innovation, productivity, and growth, as well as the new moods of the competition and value captures, all driven by big data as consumers, companies, and economic sectors explore its potentials. Chris Anderson, yeah, they are, this is a popular name. There are quite a few free, uh, famous Chris Andersons. This is a British and American light and uh, entrepreneur. He was involved in the editorial working for science and nature in the past and spent seven years working for the economists. Then he became the editor of the magazine Weird. He is a very charismatic uh, speaker and writer, wrote several books about a new model of the business. One book in 2007 called Free. Basically says, new business model is you provide the service and product free initially and profit in the long term. So what he said in this article, which he published in The Weird, is that out of every theory of human behavior, and uh, I skip this, who knows why people do what they do? The point is they do it, and we can track and measure it with unprecedented, unprecedented fidelity. With enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. So this is what I said. Now we know why. Now we know what. We don't need to know why. But actually, numbers do not speak for themselves. Okay. The big data, we can talk about various features of big data. I listed three here. More, messy, and good enough. More is clearly, now we have more data. More data require new technology, especially RT technology, to handle them, to process them, to compute with them. And also, it changes our perceptions, what we can do with the data. We can do things in the past, people think it's impossible. Yeah. We are working right now with a hedge funds company in London. They are specialized in the oil market. For the entire history, they're never using quantitative method. They do the fundamental forecasting of oil prices. When I talk to the CEO, I ask him, have you ever got it wrong? He replied quietly, never. But now, they come to us and say, since the big data, we shouldn't be left outside of it. We try to explore to see whether what we do in the past, read a newspaper, check the report of companies, and check on social media, and check the government announcements. All those information are used to make a decision whether we can do them quantitatively. And we have the fantastic development in the data mining tools, whether those tools can be used. So what they founded is a project for two years. We were hired a postdoc to do this exploratory research for oil market, entirely quantitative method. We are still recruiting a postdoc. I think the position is still open. This person will work four days at LIC per week, one day per week in the company. So those things 
in the past, they think there is no need. We are doing fine. The company has been extremely successful. But with big data, now we can think, do something new. And uh, if successful, those fund managers don't need to read the newspaper or all newspaper um, because machine can read some of them for them. Messy. Yeah, I think a, a good example to talk about the messiness of data is the Google translations. We all use Google translations when we go to a new country or different country, you speak different languages. And in the past, the translation sometimes are not so good because it makes lots of sort of obvious mistakes. But when time goes on, it's become better and better. The machine translation is not a new concept. It started in the middle 50s. But at that time, people tried to teach machine using dictionary and using grammar to translate one language from others. But as you can understand, to do, in that, to do translation that way only have limited success because when we speak, not only the words we use is important, how we say it, the facial expression, the tone we speak it, and uh, the environment, the context we speak those words also matters. For human to understand uh, each other, it's almost like after this. But to teach machine those things, almost impossible. So quickly people realize the grammar dictionary cannot be used by machine. To let machine to do the translation, it should be do it statistics. IBM started in 1980s. But IBM was very careful to select the data. They said, OK, translation should be accurate, standard. Therefore, they use the documents published by Canada, uh, Canadian government, because in Canadian, official language is English and French. Yeah? They have something, if I remember correctly, 3 million officially translated sentences stored in the computer to do the translations with partial success. Google took it on 15 years later. But this time, they are more inc inclusive. Not say only good translation are in their database. They just search on the internet. Any kind of translation available on the internet, they were stored in their computers. So instead of 3 million, they have something like 25 million sentences. And uh, it's much more successful. The size is much more successful. So statistically, can you can understand that. Bad translation means translation plus noise, yeah? But if you have enough data, the noise can be filled out. With data is big, we can compromise a bit in terms of quality. We can live with the messy data. So-called good enough is third feature with the data analytics. We no longer try to understand things properly. We understand the causality, A cause B. We are satisfied with the fact that A and B are correlated. Those two things happen together. Just like the example I talked earlier, before the hurricane, the top selling item is beer. You don't need to understand why this is the case. You just store lots of beer in the supermarket to serve the society. Okay, the big data doesn't mean more information, and more, but what it is, is the things become more complex. Therefore, to do data analytics is a joint force with the computer science, because you need to store, collection, manipulate, queuing data, and data in a different uh, format. It could be numerical data, but the text data, video, and images. To process those data, we require advanced IT technologies. Statistics extract information from data, making inferences. And applied mathematics, because complexity leading to many new mathematical challenges, require a new algorithm 
the optimization procedures. Big data doesn't mean the end of the small data. And this is a famous saying by David Hand, the power law of data size, the probability of observing a data size, data set of size n is inversely related to the power of n. So actually, there are vast more small data sets than the very large ones, which are also important. And uh, the future is not big data, is more about what we do with the big data. McKenzie Company made a forecast in 2011, which says there will be a shortage of talent necessary for organizations to take advantage of big data by 2018, which is now. The United States alone could face a shortage of 140,000 to 190,000 people with deep analytic skills, as well as 1.5 million managers and analysts with the know-how to use the analysis of big data to make effective decisions. When you read this statement, immediately occur to you why we need uh, 10 managers for each data scientist. I guess the message is lots of analytical method can be computerized and uh, people can process the data in automatic fashions. But how to make a decision based on that is more demanding. Okay, the data analytic thinking, it sounds very abstract, but actually it can be formulated in a pragmatic ways, step by steps. This is one formulation which was done by cross industrial standard process for data mining, which can be captured using these diagrams. So you have a business problem, you try to understand what kind of problem you have, what kind of data you have, or whether the data is adequate for your problem. Then you need to do a data preparation. When you talk about the data mining companies, they uniformly tell you they will spend 70 to 80% of their time effort to prepare the data, to clean the data. Once you put the X, Y nicely line up, everybody can run regressions. So once you have the modeling you need to evaluate, then you can deploy the conclusions from your data analysis. And at this stage, probably you need to go back to revise your original problem. So this is a kind of step-by-step, -step, but the iteration is the rule, not say the coincidences. So this is what the data analytical course can teach us how to do the problem, how to view a practical problem from as a data problem, then how to carry out this analysis step by step. And uh, from a large mass of data, find the information descriptive attributes to the entity of interest. This is what we call the modern selections. And if you look at that data too hard, you will find something which might not generalize beyond the data you have observed. So this is what we call the overfitting and spurious correlation, incident causalities. And uh, to be a good data analyst, as I said, you need three sets of skills, computer science, statistics, applied mathematics, but that's not enough. You need the intuition, creativity, common sense, and domain knowledge as well. So it's, uh, in a sense, is art rather than a science to be a data analyst which can solve a complex data analytical problem. The most problem we want to solve are inferential. In the sense, we try to do the forecasting for the future. As I mentioned before, we try to foresee the malfunction of a machine, and we do a service in advance. And also, we try to predict the health, then prepare 
the medical care or health insurance. Or when you are manager of a bank, then you need to make decisions about mortgage applications. And you should deny those uh, application which is going to be defaulted. Last one. Now we have a very uh, comprehensive uh, data sets at our disposal, and we can forecast the possible terrorist at attacks. But uh, there is a controversial issue here. You cannot say arrest someone in advance because he or she is more likely to launch a terrorist attack. Some ethical issues and legal challenges with big data. Individual privacy versus data collection, sharing, and usages. As we know, this is not a so big a problem in the past because we do not have that much of data, or we do not use the personal data to the extent as we have seen in recent years. The story about the Cambridge Analytics using using the data collected from the Facebook, actually, Facebook from the friends of the count, then try to manipulate uh, the American election is disturbing if those allegations are true. And uh, there is also issue about the personal service. Once people, company, do the custom profile, they try to provide a more relevant service to each individual. But uh, there is a line which should not be closed. You should not explore people's weakness since you know individuals so well. Incomprehensible nature of data-driven decisions. As I said, when you apply for a mortgage, they collect your information, then the computer come up with a conclusion and say, no, mortgage application will be denied. People will be very annoyed. Why you deny my applications? So there are also other cases like uh, that you need to know a bit more than just uh, the result. The last one is the self-regulation versus the global law enforcement. This is a big issue nowadays because in the past, companies and uh, even like a supermarket that collect the data, they try to respect the people's uh, privacy and uh, they typically do it in kind of self-regulation uh, in a way they don't do anything which is morally wrong. But now we come to the point, perhaps rely on companies' self-regulation uh, is not enough. We need to have some kind of law enforcement. But since this is a new phenomenon, in the society. We are talking about the new dimension of the space. Its activity occur across the border of the countries. A single country cannot have effective law enforcement to regulate what happens in the e-commerce, e-banking, and uh, in the cyber spaces. So that's a new thing, which will make uh, the all governments uh, in the global to think how to do it uh, most effectively. Um, most frequently used the data analysis method. This is typically what you learn if you sign up uh, for the course. Why is the classification say, as I said, the, each company has a lot of custom, customers. They try to classify custom info into different uh, groups. And uh, for example, say, this is a simple scenario. You try to classify a custom. Is likely to switch to another company or not? This is a simple case. You just divide them into two classes. One is a lawyer, one is likely to switch. Then you try using different uh, policies to retain those who want to uh, switch. Regression. Regression is more like a quantitative prediction. So how much were a given custom using the services. And the similarity matching, 
identify individuals who are similar to your most loyal customer groups. Clustering, if you want to do a personal advertising and you want to, this is different from classification. Classification is you know the classes beforehand. The classification, uh, clustering is uh, you don't know the classes. You just look at the attributes of each individual and try to divide the custom group into unknown number of clusters, such that within each cluster, people behave similarly, and different clusters, they have different behaviors. The basket, market basket analysis, as I said, this is a big uh, topic for the supermarkets, how to distribute their goods in the stores. Actually, so-called market basket analysis also is in extensively used in the social science. When you send out a questionnaire with 50 questions, and people have various kinds of answers, then you could try to see whether there is a pattern. People say, say yes on this question, and typically also say yes on some other uh, questions. So those kind of patterns will tell you some common features among the populations. Link predictions and the causal modeling and net network analysis and so on and so forth. Those are the data mining or statistical learning or machine learning tools you will learn from the data science courses. And last, I briefly mentioned the IT aspect of data analytics. This is important. And because the data science is large, you have to have a means to handle them. It's impossible for a modern data scientist who is not uh, proficient with some software tools. I list four different class of techniques. One is the computer programs. We use lots of packages. R is a free software you can use. It has all those functions written for the most commonly used uh, machine learning methods, and you also can program it to do some new task you want. And R, SAS, MATLAB, the programming language, Python, Java, C++, and C Sharp. Nowadays, we try to tell students, if you want to be a modern data scientist, you should know at least one package, R, SAS, MATLAB, or one program language, say Python. The data management, database, queuing, and uh, this is important, and also including how to handle video, image, text, data. Because if you want to computer to analyze them, you have to digitize them. Yeah, you have to digitize them. Data visualizations, there are tools developed I think the tabular is something you can learn if you sign up to this course. There's another R package called the ggplot2, which produces some nice visualizations. A good plot is so powerful, tell you lots about the data. Last is the parallel computing and distributing process. This is what people saw, the big data platforms, and you use them to access the cloud computings. And typically, the problem is so big, you need to use multi, multiple cores for computing and to store your data. One thing I like to say at this point is actually nowadays, there are lots of development that try to make all those things easier. For example, within R, people create lots of new functions to access the database, to do the parallel computing. Yeah, if you are reasonably good on R, it probably only takes you 20 or half hour to learn how to run a program using parallel computing. So things are changing quickly, and uh, the idea is we should make all those big data tools more accessible to the general audiences. I think I have used all my time. I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Yao. Please do take a seat. 
Joining Professor Yao on stage will be my colleague, Dr. Zhang Tianlin. Dr. Zhang actually graduated top of his class, not only at SIM, but worldwide. That earned him a full LSE scholarship to pursue masters in London. And after graduation, he returned to SIM, now as a lecturer. He was then offered an NUS research scholarship for a PhD in economics. A passionate behavioral economist, Dr. Zhang has published his research in leading international journals, and currently he's the academic head for the University of London programs at SIM. Let us welcome my colleague and LSE alumnus, Dr. Zhang Tianlin. So ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you, we're using slido.com to collect questions for Professor Yao. And you can like the questions, and that will sort of, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, give it priority. The code is LSE18, as can be seen on the screen. So Jianlin, over to you then. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Prof Yao. Thank you for giving us such fascinating lecture and I am truly impressed by the power of data science and data analytics. And one very important takeaway I have from your lecture is the three cautions you summarized. So to do well in today's world, one need to have got IQ, EQ, and now DQ, data quotient. While I was listening to your talk, actually one question keep occupy my mind, which I think many audiences here also want to hear about your thoughts. So my question is about investment in stocks market. <laughs> uh, we were told that markets behave like a random work, and stock prices are not supposed to be predictable. And it has been shown monkeys can actually do better than professional managers, money managers in stock picking. And now the professional money managers, now they are armed with data science, big data. Do you foresee that professional money managers are going to beat monkeys? So what is your thoughts? So that's a very good question. I guess when people say the monkey can beat the professional trader, they typically refer to one particular method or one particular model. Uh, stock markets, as we know, there is a PhD thesis written more than 100 years ago. The best mathematical model to describe the stock market is random work. Therefore, it's unpredictable. Of course, later on, the economists come with this efficient uh, hypothesis, uh, uh, efficient market hypothesis. If that's true, then indeed, market is unpredictable, and uh, the professional trader is as powerful as a monkey. As a monkey. But the truth is, the market is not always so efficient, especially when you talk about the high-frequency market. If you can zoom in the market in the time scale of 20 to 40 milliseconds, which is less than half a second, you can see lots of correlations. And the fact is, there are so many hedge funds and banks make money, that shows there are ways to forecast uh, the financial markets. And uh, typically, they combine various uh, knowledge, mm -hmm. including quantitative and less quantitative methods together to do the forecasting. To answer your question, with big data, certainly, now there is a scope to explore more quantitative method, because you can not only see what happens in Singapore stock market, you also can access instantaneous the information across the global, which should be helpful. And you also can access the information from the social media. People's mood also affects uh, all the weather or government announcement. All those things can be taken into account. I think uh, it is reasonable to say with the big data, with the modern technology, we should be able to forecast the, super uh, the stock market better than before, quantitative. But on the other hand, stock market being a stock market is a, is a strong, unpredictable 
ability there. If you can predict the stock market accurately, the market will disappear. Yeah. Well, that's exciting and philosophical. Um, <laughs> I think it's also more or less what happened in, in, in the reality. Yeah. Thank you. Well, there have been a couple of questions uh, posted by audiences, and let's take a look at them and answer. Can you help us to answer some of the popular questions? Well, the first one, 14 likes. So the question is, what are the key academic background required to succeed in studying data science and business analytics? I guess there are some audience here as parents of the potential yeah. students. I mentioned uh, in my talk briefly, there are three sets of skills you required. The IT skills, the statistics, and applied mathematics. But as a applied data scientist, first thing you need to do is you should be able to handle this vast, complex data. Therefore, IT skill is a necessary tool to enter this area before you can say anything else. So this is a kind of weakness in the traditional statistical training. We teach students R, but uh, in still have in mind people dealing with a data of science, hundreds, thousands. But now it's completely different. It's not to say the data become bigger. Also, it's unstructured, it's an image, it's a text, and how to transform those into the numerical data, digits require lots of IT skills. Then we have the statistical learning, or people call the machine learning, or data mining. Those are more or less referred to the same sets of skills which I mentioned. Those are important to do the data analysis once you have put data into the form like X, Y. Of course, if you want to do research, or if you want to use something which is not available in the Packages, develop some new things, then this is where this applied mathematics optimizations, algorithms, skills kicks in. So, in a way, data science requires more than just a statistician or computer scientist. So, it's a tall order. Thank you. I think your answer is really clear. Let's look at second most popular question. Wow, this is about privacy. With the Facebook incidents, do you fear that the public will be more aware of their personal privacy and hence less likely to share their data? But if they, let, they are less likely to share, then the data might not be as the trouble powerful. Is, the trouble is we don't have a choice nowadays. Mm. We all carry the mobile phones, so that your every, mo every movement are recorded somewhere. The reason your information is not in public domain is Typically, we are not interested in each individual's uh, things. And the privacy is a very important issue. It's uh, actively researched areas. People talking about the medical big data. Uh, in the past, I'm talking about, say, 10 years ago. Because you need to let people to access those data in order to do the medical research. It's no good to say, oh, keep the data away from everyone else. Then this defeated the purpose. So what they do in the past is they just black out their name or a few other things. That's enough. But now it's no longer the case because the data are available from all channels, from all means. So you have one set of data here combined with a few sets of data elsewhere. Then people can easily figure out who this individual is. Therefore, how to, to make data uh, private and uh, try to add, insert a certain amount of noise is a big research area because you shouldn't insert the noise such that people couldn't extract the useful information. So there's a big research uh, activities in those things. My own sort of wish is there is a law, global law, established to protect the use of the data such that company can use the data to serve for the society, for the individual, but not explore individual's weakness, like what has been 
alleged the uh, Cambridge Analytica did for the American elections. Those things should be forbidden. Thank you. Uh, but unfortunately, we are living in a world that we are trading our privacy for the convenience yes. that we, we kind of added it to it. So, yeah, I, I guess each individual has a choice. Like say, when you use mm -hmm. Google browser, you can log into your personal account, which I always do because I switch on different devices. So which device I use, I always have my so fixed setting here, my history there, I can easily access it. This is the convenience. But the price to pay for that is you let Google to record every move you have with their browsers. Mm. And uh, I guess this is fine as long as we know what we do. There are lots of sayings that the IT companies should make their privacy term conditions more comprehensible to individuals, which is not so yes. easy because any legal, legal documents in order to be legal is incomprehensible in a way. <laughs> That's true too. Now, in the interest of time, because we have overrun, yeah. uh, then in the interest of time, let's pick one last question. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, if two correlated data sets have different possible logical explanations, how do data analysis confirm which one is the true hidden logic? Oh, this is very technical. Yeah, as I show you, the correlation is something which could happen as a coincidence, like this spirit correlations. And uh, statistics or data analysis is a tool which can help you to understand the, the subject matter behind the data. But it can never infer the true causality. I know there are Nobel Prize awarded to the econo uh, economists who invented the causality analysis based on time series model. But those are predictive causality, not physical real causality. To do a data analysis to make the practical meaningful conclusions, you need more than the data analytic skills. You need a lot knowledge of the subject matter. You need to use your common senses. Yes, agree. So it's just a tool. Mm. It's not everything. Unlike what they say, with big data, we can forget about theory. Theory are still important. Thank you. So after all, we need to adopt a social science approach to analyzing the data. So theory is still very important. Uh, Prof Yao will still be available to talk to some of you if you still have questions for him at the reception. So uh, thank you so much, Prof Yao, thank for you. such an insightful lecture. And we are truly honored. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please. Uh, let's take a photo together with Prof Yao from which side? OK, good. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming for this lecture. Thank you, Professor Yao and Dr. Zhang. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending tonight's lecture, and we hope you found the session fruitful. Uh, please do stay back, as Dr. Zhang says, for more discussion. There are also some exhibits showcasing the University of London program here at SIM. May I please request for our guests at uh, rows D and E to take their leave before the rest of the audience does. Thank you, and have a good evening. <laughs>